Hey fellow fraud fighters, I'm Jimmy Fong, CCO at Sayon, and welcome to the Cat and Mouse podcast. Sayon is fortunate to work with businesses such as the likes of Revolut, New Bank and Patreon in the fight against fraud. But with this podcast, we want to provide a comfortable space for people to talk about the daily challenges, topics on the horizon, and ultimately give us all a better insight into the mindset of fraudsters. And with that, on with the show. So Darren, massive welcome. Thanks for trekking across East London uh, to get to us in Soho. Uh, excited to have you uh, as part of our season two podcast. And so some of the pre-discussion points were around um, your help and setup with Lockdown Risk, the consultancy you uh, run. But then the reason we wanted you on the show was because of your uh, yeah quite unique experience all the way from developer beginning uh, through to kind of helping on digital identity of Experian for over a decade. And then also you in parallel running today uh, as chairman of uh, international forums and one of those subgroups is uh, the Fraud Prevention Network. Um, so having a very holistic view on fraud detection and security in this very prescient time of the pandemic. Yeah, it's been really great to have um, kind of a, a breadth of experience. Um, I describe myself as an ex-geek uh, because I, I started my career as a developer. Uh, I uh, studied computer science at university um, and my lead into fraud prevention uh, was via um, risk management. Uh, some of the coding that I did originally was for decisioning systems that um, that Experian, the credit bureau, um, has. And I kind of moved from credit risk into fraud risk, uh, became a product manager and became less hands-on with the code. Uh, and that was my kind of inroad into, into fraud prevention. Um, so I've worked with uh, a lot of international uh, banks, insurance companies, telecoms companies. Um, but since uh, since starting my own consultancy business, that's led me to work for an ever wider set of organisations. Um, I think I think it's probably fair to say that kind of 15, 20 years ago, it was primarily financial services that's being very heavily hit. Uh, but now we're so much more online, and all businesses have an element of risk, whether it's financial or whether it's data risk. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been really cool. Um, it's also been good to see things from the regulatory perspective as well as um, the pure fraud prevention. Uh, so I, I have been a Mully laundering reporting officer uh, in the past. Um, and it's, it's always, I always find it fascinating that um, there are subtly different communities. So uh, the people working in AML are not always the same people working in fraud prevention. Uh, and equally, um, I, I get involved with uh, cybercrime prevention and in, infosec, and that is another crowd of people. And so each each set of people have their own subtly different language uh, and their own community, but they're tackling similar or overlapping issues. Um, so having dab- dabbled across all of those, um, that's given me a, quite a, quite a, an interesting view of how things work in in, in different parts of uh, business and in, in different uh, with different mindsets. That's like a real practical thing though is these siloed even within the same organization right is siloed teams having different perspectives and different KPIs and even having different language as you mentioned there. What was that one of the design reasons behind um, you helping to chair kind of the international forums uh, group because there's so many subsets within there as well. Yeah no absolutely um, I've always been a big advocate of trying to break down barriers um, and kind of break down silos, uh, be it across different sectors that can find innovative ways to collaborate. But also within organisations, it is a bit of a, a bugbear of mine that quite often you have these multiple disparate teams that could be working more effectively together, uh, but end up sometimes even fighting each other in terms of trying to get the appropriate level of resource to try and solve some of the some of the real world problems that we have. That's excellent. And you, you mentioned just before we went live on the talk um, on the fraud prevention uh, forum itself, one of the unique things you're trying to do is um, break down the classic vertical, um, uh, say, uh, kind of focus. And it's kind of a cross vertical there. Yeah, uh, yeah. As well. Yeah. yeah um, so I, I, I chair um, a, 
a, a forum called the Fraud Prevention Network. Um, we meet quarterly at the moment. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, it's all been um, remote, uh, remote stuff. But uh, we're optimistic of uh, returning to face-to-face -face meetings or running running them as a, as a hybrid kind of a set of sessions. But um, what's really great about the Fraud Prevention Network is that we have representatives from banking. Uh, we have um, uh, there's a lot of uh, B2B sales. Um, so we have uh, tech companies, suppliers. Uh, we've got hard hardware companies. Um, obviously, some of them dabble into uh, uh, B two C as well as B two B, but we're relatively unique. Um, there's a lot. Of, there, there are a lot of very good forums out there, uh, but they tend to be sector specific, or they tend to focus on um, uh, B two C. Is the UK uh, kind of uh, heavily focused, or is it a bit wider uh, field in geo? It started as UK focus, uh, and as a side effect of the pandemic, um, we now attract more of an international audience because we are running them virtually. Um, so yeah, we also get some interesting international perspectives, um, the the patterns and types of fraud. Um, there's a lot of commonality, but there are also subtle differences from one geography to the next. And uh, so if you're an organization that is um, trading in, in multiple regions, that, that can be of real benefit to get that uh, that insight. And, that, and how, um, it, I guess, how candid are you finding that discussion point? How how safe is it a space for those uh, merchants to yeah, d discuss and share some of the latest kind of whatever they're suffering from or patterns they're seeing? How candid does it get? Um, thankfully, um, our members are, are very open. Um, uh, that's because they, they recognize the, the benefits of, of being open and that fraud is a shared and common problem. Um, we do operate under Chatham House rule. Um, so people are very well assured that what is said at, uh, at the forum meeting stays kind of within the, the four virtual walls. <laughs> um, but yeah, on 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 the whole, um, uh, I'm 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 always very pleased at how how open a lot of people are. Um, it's not always been uh, the case. That that's like the classic thing with uh, you know even with uh, uh, sector specific kind of uh, forums, right? Is there's always an element uh, of competition or proprietary information or competitive edge uh, there of maybe not being as candid as uh, you would like uh, in, in those settings. That's the, 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 maybe the sad side of when we're on the fraud fighter end mm -hmm. versus say fraudsters, right? Who have no problems sharing on Telegram uh, and there is no competitive edge because everything's wide open. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that is a key challenge for us. Um, obviously we have to um, operate within data protection law as well, uh, which is puts us sometimes at a disadvantage. Um, we do uh, try to facilitate legal ways of um, sharing relevant data and information, and uh, we're, we're big advocates of, um, of, of that approach. Um, but yeah, uh, culturally, in some regions, it's, it's certainly more difficult, and uh, it's just a it can be really frustrating because, as you say, the, the criminals are all working together and collaborating, and uh, their business model is sometimes more successful than, than uh, genuine businesses. Uh, and they don't have um, those considerations with regards to compliance and, uh, and sensitivity of data and the like, and they can just do what they want. Yeah, I was, uh, had a chat at the back end of last week with um a chief risk officer over at a tech company, and they made a really interesting point talking about most times when we're trying to freely discuss how to uh, combat fraudsters, uh, the biggest bugbear of that person, I remember saying, was these self-imposed restrictions that um, because we're scared of what our boss may think or our organization may think, if we speak too candidly on our side as a private organization, and that's a really tricky dynamic to get past, um, you know, like I said, versus the converse from a fraudster's point of view, there's no, there's no kind of uh, <laughs> kind of thought to that, right? Well, that that's where some some of my work gets quite interesting when I um, consult with organisations. Um, it, it gives the opportunity for uh, an organisation to have a third party come in with uh, um, without any fixed or set views, um, and 
they can often kind of reveal some interesting um, some interesting issues or break down some some barriers that might exist between uh, various different um, members of the key leadership team. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so maybe jumping back into kind of what you're seeing as um, chair and moderator of um, of uh, kind of fraud prevention forum, um, what kind of hot topics are you seeing pop up just now, which are top of mind for some of those conversations? What kind of buzz are you seeing uh, that, that's topical right now? Um, well, as we're kind of towards what I'd like to think is the new normal, um, there has over a prolonged period of time been a very big spike in in fishing um and I, i'd like to think that um people are getting a bit more wise to it but it's, it's still it's still a, a major problem and a large factor of that is is down to the fact that a lot of us have been distracted with new working practices uh, adapting to remote working uh not necessarily having the level of controls that are ideal for that situation. Um, but many more businesses are now kind of realizing that, okay, this is this is a potential long-term way of working now, or, or at least some kind of hybrid model. Um, and so we've been advocating taking a, a step back now and kind of revisiting uh, how you deal with remote working and making sure that the, um, the controls are appropriate to to the job role and the the data flows that are, that are occurring um, the biggest issue tends to be the human factor and that's why fishing is so successful uh, so I, we also um, are very big advocates of uh, short and frequent training sessions for staff to kind of remind them of uh, of some of the key things to to look out for um, in terms of some of the other trends, I think that there has been some positives to the pandemic. Um, it's caused a bit of an acceleration uh, for the adoption of digital identity. Uh, and I, I think that's that's an area that we're going to see a lot of movement over the, the next uh, year or so as well. Um, and I think that will help to resolve some of the issues that we, we commonly face. Do you, do you, do you, what would be the downsides of digital identity um, from, from your point of view? The downsides of initially kind of getting the public to trust whatever um, whatever platform is there, whatever scheme is, is put in place. Um, certainly here in the UK, there's always been a real nervousness around having a, a form of identity card or identity scheme. Uh, and so it needs to be handled in a sensitive manner uh, to ensure that um, that whatever schemes are put in place are fully trusted. Um, and then I think once we get over that, I think we've got a lot of advantages rather than uh, disadvantages. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in your view because uh, different parts of the world clearly have these schemes at different stages. Uh, and some of them have them live and very uh, seen as very successful implementations, right? So I think of like Scandinavia and Bank ID uh, having a, a real tangible effect. And I think there's a lot of uh, kind of in our space of fraud, fraud uh, tech and fraud prevention. There's there's almost the assumption of um, oh the Nordics they've got it locked down. Uh, we don't have fraud problems. Uh, do, do you think it's as uh, as one sided a view as that, or, or do you think there's kind of still uh, uh, areas of improvement uh, should fraudsters just pack up bags and never target the nordics <laughs> no i'm sure the nordics uh, do still get targeted um it's a case of squeezing the balloon um the the uh, is the analogy i like to take um you're often solving one problem only for the fraudsters to then come up with something different um come up with a new angle a new approach uh, and so um that kind of leads us back to your name of your podcast, uh, Cat and Mouse. It is always a, a chase. Squeeze well, a balloon. I've not heard that, but that makes sense. <laughs> totally sense. It yeah. instantly makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So you squeeze it in one one side, and it pops out somewhere else. And and that's been our long term view. Is um, I think part of 
uh, the flip side on the fraudster's end, it's really a testament to li literally creativity of us as humans, right? That that's what it's about. It's about getting under, over, you know, to the side of, and it's about human creativity uh, as much as anything. Uh, versus say a static conversation where it's done and dusted, it's dealt with, and that's it. Yeah, it certainly keeps um, uh, this job interesting. <laughs> um, no two days are ever necessarily the same, and uh, yeah, you need to keep up with. Um, with what the latest uh, issues and trends are. But um, there is a danger that you can become too focused upon some of the technicalities or some of the, some of the more nuanced things that are happening and then take your eye off uh, some of the simple stuff. And as soon as you do that, that's, that's when you can really come a cropper. Um, so I, I do always make sure when I'm working with, um, with fraud prevention teams that, uh, that Yes, have a look at what the new trends and and uh, and the new attack patterns are, but make sure you don't take your eye off the basics, uh, because as soon as you do, um, the the force is always going to go for um, the weakest uh, link in the chain. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's see, let's revisit. You talked about um, especially with where you help today organisations around uh, literally the consultants called lockdown risk, right? Um, so you talked about the, the forced move for organizations to go remote and what that means. Uh, you talked about phishing uh, in terms of that is still a massive hot topic. Um, are there other areas um, for organizations to consider then, when, uh, particularly in this time of uh, remote work and digitalization? I think the, uh, another trend that we're going to be seeing um, and is, is already happening is um, increased complexity and increased requirements for various areas of regulations and compliance. Um, so we, we're already getting a bit of a potential divergence between UK GDPR versus EU GDPR. Various other countries um, or in the US at state level are implementing similar laws. Um, Anti-money laundering regulation is constantly evolving as well. And, and again, the UK could diverge somewhat from the EU. Um, uh, so I, I think we're, we're entering into a time where we've got some really cool technologies and capabilities out there, uh, but we also have a, a lot of legal requirements to also balance um, and getting that right is um is also a benefit um for the fraud prevention piece in general uh but also in in instilling confidence in um between businesses if if i can trust that um that a certain business has a certain level of uh, compliance and protection or certification then then i can more confidently work with them versus a business that can't prove that so yeah, I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be a pretty complex uh, time that we're going to be facing. Yeah, that's a really interesting topic to unpack. And and you, you're in a unique position as a consultant because you do come in with third party eyes, giving impartiality. Hopefully, and are there common uh, guidance that you offer to uh, your clients around things like how to assess, you know, uh, latest technology, which might be a bit earlier stage and maybe lacks, say, some of the. Um, the kind of security of ISO accreditation because it's so early stage and innovative versus say um, uh, kind of when you're working with more established player, but innovation is potentially uh, a, a, not as um, not as top of mind because it's been around a lot longer. How do you balance that? It, it's really about getting to know the organization to understand where in, in that kind of journey they are at the moment, um, what their level of risk appetite is like, um, uh, kind of understanding how they operate and what their overall goals are. Um, that then uh, typically allows me to, to then understand well, what is appropriate for, for that organization, uh, to understand what they have in place at the moment. Are they using their existing tools effectively? Um, or is there a significant gap, um, which quite often does come up because, simply because I'm, I'm coming in with a fresh set of eyes and uh, it is very easy for, uh, for anyone to become a bit ingrained in what they do with their day-to-day -day role. 
um, and can therefore kind of miss a trick. Um, and, and so um, I always work very collaboratively uh, with, uh, with my clients uh, and it's, it's like setting up a, a journey. Um, let's, let's first understand each other. Let's look to see if there are any immediate quick wins versus uh, more strategic projects or plans uh, to hopefully resolve any issues that are identified. Yeah, and I love the fact that um, uh, by be, uh, being chair of uh, some of those kind of forums, your your eyes and ears are like tuned in to what the latest hot topics are, right? Uh, that uh, are being discussed, so you understand maybe you know what the next trends are coming from a risk point of view. What are fraudsters kind of pivoting to and taking advantage of? Like you said, it just shifts and morphs over time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, our our forum members uh, drive the um, the agenda for all of the meetings. Um, so uh, that kind of then gives me a, a task to go out and find the relevant speakers for a particular topic uh, that that might be hot at any moment in time. Um, this year, uh, we we already have some sessions that are going to be covering um, the uh, the plans for digital identity and and how um, the different schemes um, what how can they interoperate and how can there be some kind of common commonality. Uh, um, so yeah, we've got some, we've got some interesting speakers on that. We've got uh, some interesting speakers on ransomware as well, which has been raised uh, by our, our members as being uh, of concern. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's that's a really good topics to dive into there, especially yeah, ransomware. Of course, we see you know media is kind of perfectly attuned to this, right? Anything that breaks is unfortunately attention grabbing and terrible news does well. Um, what, what, what kind of, um, I guess, discussion points are coming off that ransomware topic then? There's always the uh, debates as to whether uh, it is appropriate to pay up a ransom or not. Um, and how do you handle that? Um, in the past, uh, ransomware was very much um, kind of a, a, a hit and hope exercise in, in so much that you might get hit with a particular piece of malware and there would be a set um there would be a set fee to um to unlock your network or unlock your data but increasingly ransomware is being very specifically targeted and researched against specific organizations and they will actually make an assessment as to how much they think they can squeeze out of you uh, rather than it, than it just being a hit and hope exercise um and so that that leads to some interesting debate as to um, do we negotiate? Do we pay? Um, are there even any guarantees that your network will be unlocked if you pay anyway, uh, or do you just end up on the sucker list to be hit again in the future? I'd love to hear the answers or, or latest suggestions on you know uh, on on that advice. Yeah, we we um we see also on our side um, the the kind of big macro trends are. Exactly what you just said there, Dan. Sophistication is becoming uh, more so, as in they're targeting organizations and working out what's a lifetime value of that prospect, right? It's the same thing that good SaaS does to assess how to help market. The fraudsters are doing the same, that's one trend. And then the other trend is um, almost the fact that these are available as services now, yes. as a ransomware. It's not like you have to be like your background to be able to code and create from uh, bottom up these solutions, you can just literally crime as a service tap into. And that's the scary uh, kind of trend we're seeing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can get, for example, a, a password cracker off off the web for just a few a few pounds is, is all they're going to charge for it. Um, uh, I'd like to think that um, another trend is that we will see the slow death of the static password, but uh, we're still a way off of that. Uh, but the reality is that uh, a short or weak password can be brute force hacked. Um, it's trivial to do that. Um, uh, and that again kind of leads back to the, to the human element uh, and, and some of the sensible protections that, that we all need to, to make. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, 
So, so I, I take away from this conversation um, on digital identity, uh, on the use of tech against some of these trends that are happening, and the and the sophistication and kind of uh, kind of how you should be applying those as well. But I'd love to ask what you, your view also, especially from the dev background. What's your view on uh, technologies like machine learning, kind of in our space of fraud detection? Do do, do you have kind of particular advice around how? Um, clients should be viewing AI and machine learning? Yeah, um, I, I have in the past had very mixed views about um, AI and, and machine learning solutions. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, kind of some of the historical neural net type approaches have had some successes, but where historically they've been weak is that um, they give out these referrals and it's not always clear why a referral has come out of a neural network or from some AI machine learning algorithm. And I think that's an area that is getting much, much better now for machine learning and, and AI is it, it's, it's becoming more um, more intelligent and better at, at explaining to the, the end user why something is being flagged um, and so I think there's some there's some real positive um, pieces of work that are, that are still happening in that area as well yeah that's really interesting we um, and it's my background uh, as we were, before we went live is definite trend away from say a black box AI model and moving more into as you mentioned explainability yeah. transparent be able to understand why why something got accepted or rejected essentially and, and, and the obligation to the end customer for that as well, right? Yeah. I think that's a good, healthy trend. I yeah. agree with you completely. And also data quality as well. Um, quite naturally, if you're if you're teaching up a model and your data quality is is not great, then you know garbage in equals garbage out. Um, and that's that's going to be true um, today as as it has been in the past. Uh, there's there's only so much that you can do if you've got noisy or or, or poor quality data. Yeah, that's an uh, absolute tenant there. We, we work and we're fortunate in time to work with uh, some of uh, the coolest kind of fintechy brands and they have very sophisticated uh, data science teams, machine learning teams, but uh, of course that tenant completely holds true, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's never changed. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, Dar Darren, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you again for coming in. Uh, we always make sure we do ask our guests, uh, our podcast, as you noted, is the Say on Cat and Mouse podcast. Um, so we're always curious from our guests in, in the world of professional fraud fighter like yourself uh, versus say professional fraudster and in that world who is the cat and who is the mouse in your opinion well i'm i'm a little bit biased here as a cat owner <laughs> um we're certainly uh as fraud fighters we're certainly the cat um in 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 my view um well, it's well known that cats have become domesticated uh, because of our need to keep pests away from, from food stores and the like. And, and, and that's how we've kind of adopted cats over time. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that if, um, if uh, we didn't have the cat, we'd get over, overrun with mice. Um, and and that, that is what, what happens to organizations that, uh, that fall short, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I would say we are definitely the cat. Although now I'm thinking about Itchy and Scratchy and uh, the roles are reversed in that cartoon. So, <laughs> so apart from Itchy and Scratchy, um, uh, we're, we're the cat. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. It's great to have you. Thanks for the invite, it's been a pleasure.